My name is Kwabna Chenchehini Boati. Many thanks for joining us here on News Today. To our first story is our under Supreme Court has ordered government to produce the nation's agreement with the United States of America, which informed its decision to admit into Ghana two former inmates of Guantanamo Bay. Earlier this year, two private citizens, Margaret Bamfo and Henry Nanabuachi, sued the Attorney General and Minister of Justice, together with the Minister of Interior, accusing President John Dramani Mahama of illegally bringing in the two former Guantanamo Bay detainees in contravention of the laws of the state. Uh, in a bit, we'll be speaking to our reporter who was on the ground, Raymond Nkwa. But let's now speak to lawyer for the plaintiffs, Nane J. Bafo, uh, who joins us on phone now with some thoughts on the issue. Uh, Council, good afternoon. Many thanks for joining us. Uh, I presume this is really uh, what you're looking forward to. But what is to happen now that you've secured this ruling? Um, good afternoon to your listeners. Um, I think that this is a very significant ruling in the scheme or in the conduct of this matter. Very essentially, um, the Supreme Court, contrary to the view of or the position that the AG has at all material times taken in this matter, that the agreement could not be produced simply because it would, of, it, it would offend the State Secrecy Act and then it would be against um, national security and so on and so forth. Has come to conclu the conclusion that that, that, that position is not tenable in the scheme of the laws of this country and that the agreement should be tended. And so, therefore, it's a very significant victory. Now, it's victory because how else was the Supreme Court going to determine this matter without seeing the agreement? It would have been akin to you taking a bed and then taking off the feathers and, you know, sending it to some elderly persons and asking them to identify what kind of bed it is. So now... The bed has been brought to the Supreme Court with all the feathers on it for the Supreme Court to determine whether or not this bed, you know, is of the kind that is within the contemplation of Article 75. So for us, it's very important. It would have been like going to court without evidence, right? And that was the position that the AG has, has very, if, if, I, if, 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 if you like, is sincerely taken. That we are come to the court without the most significant evidence which, which underpins our case. Yeah. But they have forgotten that under the rules of evidence, regardless of where the evidence is, even if it's in the custody of your opponent, that the court can order for sin to be produced. And that is the significant, you know, significant speech which has been achieved today. Are there any timelines to uh, when exactly government is supposed to uh, produce these documents? No, the documents have already been produced for examination, right? As mm. to whether or not it is one that was protected under Section One of the State Secrecy Act, or it's of the kind which, which, is, which, uh, if produced, would be a threat to national security. So the Supreme Court simply came to court to say that the AG's argument, which have, which it had all along held, right, is untenable, and therefore the agreement is being produced and admitted in evidence as Exhibit A. So fundamentally, it's been produced, right. you know. Right. Leon and AJ for many thanks for your time on news today this afternoon, and I'll be bringing you some more on that. But let's now return to that live event we were bringing to you just before uh, the news, where there's a, a bit of a partnership between the health ministry as well as the USAID on the Healthy Life Program. Uh, health Minister Alex Evifia is currently speaking at the program. Millions of Ghanaians to make critical, important life choices and adopt positive health behaviors to improve their health and well being. Over the years, in collaboration, government has been working to break the back of disease epidemics, such as malaria, cholera, HIV AIDS, that plague our nation. Together, we are expanding access through establishing the CHIPS compound, community-based health planning and services across the country, upgrading health facilities, including hospitals and polyclinics, improving the health workforce through capacity building, strengthening the health system, and providing support services to deliver quality health care, while the National Health Insurance Scheme is creating opportunities for millions of Ghanaians to access and utilize these services. Although it's being challenged, we find that more and more people want to join. We are taking important and bold steps to build a strong, and vibrant healthcare system. But simply improving the healthcare infrastructure is not enough if people are not motivated or empowered to access their services and make good health an everyday 
thing. It is also important to note that embracing good life as an everyday thing, the role of the service provider cannot be overemphasized. It will be important for all health workers to demonstrate ownership of good life and welcome people to the facilities with a smile. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we all know that simple everyday things, such as washing our hands with soap before preparing food and cooking, before and after eating, after ha having tended to nature's call, after cleaning a child's bottom, and after cleaning babies, most people wash their hands with soap only after eating in order to get rid of oil or the smell of the food. Washing with soap needs to be constantly done. It has been well documented that everyday things, such as putting the newborn to the breast immediately within 30 minutes after delivery, and giving the baby only breast milk for the first six months of life, and I don't want the civil servants to start talking about extended leave, <laughs> has been shown to save the lives of infants, increase cognitive ability, reduce their disease burdens, even in latter years, including asthma and diabetes. Breastfeeding, exclusive, exclusively for the first six months of life, has also been shown to reduce the disease burden of the mothers. Timely introduction of complementary foods at six months, using everyday foods, also helps children to a great start in life. Yet these simple everyday practices have been forgotten by many families resulting in poor nutrition and stunting of children. It is a well-known fact that if everybody slept under an insecticide-treated net every night throughout the night, they will be adequately protected from malaria. Yet this simple everyday thing has been forgotten, and malaria continues to be amongst the top 10 diseases accounting for outpatient department attendances in health facilities. Moreover, it is well known and documented that simply taking good care of the umbilical cord by keeping it clean and dry after delivery can prevent newborn deaths from sepsis or infection. Uh, doctor, did I get that right? <laughs> These simple everyday behaviors and practices are the ones that can assure a future for the many children being born today. And in the future, and assure us for good health and well-being now and in the future. In good life, we are assured of healthier, happier, long lives, and peace of mind for all Ghanaians as it seeks to bring health to the doorsteps of communities. Distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, we need to motivate and engage people to take control of their health. We need a well-motivated, and empowered populace to take greater ownership of their health and adopt healthy behaviors that will keep them and their families healthy and happy. To achieve this behavior change, we need a comprehensive, effective, and directed health promotion brand that seeks to engage our fellow citizens with critical health information and ideas that inspire others to take action. We need a comprehensive, integrated health communication brand that speaks to people with them and for them and gives them that information they want and need to know based not on a single health issue but on a range of health issues according to your life stage so they can live that good life that makes it an everyday thing. Today we launch such a comprehensive integrated health promotion brand led by the Ghana Health Services Health Promotion Department under the leadership of the Family Health Division with support from USAID's Communi Communicate for Health Project and other partners, the new Good Life Live It Well Health Promotion brand will seek to engage all Ghanaians in a dialogue to improve the health by reaching them with meaningful, impactful, and even entertaining social and behavioral change communication programming. You like to know I'm on the last page. <laughs> I wish to thank the Director General and staff of the Ghana Health Service, 
USAID, UNICEF, UK Aid, and all the individuals and organizations who have joined forces to relaunch the Good Life Live It Well campaign. Can I specifically at this stage thank, thank the team that actually worked together? On days like this, you see the final product, and everybody is uh, happy, and it's a nice ceremony. But the amount of work that has actually gone into this, uh, you can't begin to even imagine. So I say a big thank you to all those who have been involved in actually putting this together. Government remains committed and will continue to work with all development partners to realize their dreams, aspirations, and desires of the Ghanaian people for good health. We will continue to work with all stakeholders to address obstacles that stand in our way of meeting the health-related social development goals. I was wondering when the SDGs were going to appear. Ghana can and will become a country where everyone can have a healthy and long life. Together we can make it good life, an everyday thing. Welcome to good life. Live it well. And uh, Dr. Pia Dinja, what is the slogan? I'm supposed to say good life, is it? Okay, so good life. It's an everyday thing. And that was uh, Health Minister Alex Segbefia addressing the crowd there on uh, the launch of the Good Life program. We'll bring you more on that in other bulletins. But away from that now, and a group of NDC foot soldiers have today besieged the party's headquarters, demanding the president grants pardon to some three persons jailed by the Supreme Court over contempt charges. Sally Fumase, popularly known as Mugabe of Munti FM, was slapped with a four-month jail term with two others after being convicted in a contempt case. Alistair Nelson and Gordon Nakogan, all belonging to the ruling NDC, threatened the lives of judges during a radio discussion. But the angry NDC members say they want the president to grant the contemptuous pardon. Let's now speak to Joseph Akable, uh, who has been at the NDC's headquarters since morning, and he's bringing us a lot more on uh, happenings there now. Akable, we have too many thanks for joining us. Can you tell us what the situation uh, at the NDC headquarters is as we speak now? Now, Kamnath is at the party headquarters across um, the IPOP headquarters. You have about three police vehicles parked there. You have about 30 officers from the Adabeka police station also here. The leader of the team has entered the office with that to the party chairman. The party chairman um, came to the office at about 11.30 a.m. But before entering, he addressed the supporters here, telling them to remain calm and that the party was doing all to ensure and that they helped they help those who have been sentenced. He also mentioned the fact that Mr. Kofi Adam, the national organizer, led a team that accompanied the three to the prisons yesterday, as well as visiting their family. So, from the forces, I also hear he mentioned that the president will be meeting the Council of State team with regards to the prerogative of mercy and shrine in Article 17 of the Constitution. For that to come in effect, the president has to uh, do that in consultation with the Council of State. And that is what the forces did. At that point in time, I was away from here, so I couldn't get that particular information. But that is what they mentioned as well. So that is the situation here at the party headquarters. So as it stands, the, the leader of the police team is in, and he's in person with the party chairman. Joseph Akable, many thanks for that update. We'll be coming back to you for some more uh, later on. But earlier on news, there's one of the lawyers of the jail contemptors, George Low, reiterated the call for pardon for his client, saying the ruling by the judges was too harsh. Uh, the people are saying we are saying that, yes, we accept the Supreme Court uh, judgment. We have spoken. We are the final court of the land. And, uh, we respect the judgment and officers of the court. However, we are of the view that the sentence was too harsh and that it is not the best to give custodial sentences for speech in respect of how bad in our modern democracy. Mm. In that light, we are saying that the president should send the right signal that our government has no intention of criminalizing speech and therefore he should come and he should come use his powers and article 72 to uh, intervene and uh, give any of the things that uh, the article offers to us he could do a respite he could do a remission he could do anything 
in consultation with the Council of State. We already we know that Lord Akujeto has been biased towards this uh, 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 case. He has, even while the matter was in court, he had already even, even passed judgment and said that it should be dealt with severely, which in itself could constitute contempt uh, of, of, of court. But having said that, I am saying that, look, where a general secretary 30 years or more at the bar of a leading political party threatening the judges and ask them to go and buy, ask their wives to start preparing for their funeral, he was left off with a fine. And we are saying that if first time offenders who are not known to the law, who then themselves are not lawyers and do not understand the full remit of the law, if they go foul of the law, yes, we say they go foul of the law. They have been convicted beyond the bad, we can find we think it's fair, but to cause to send them, you know, to prison for what they have expressed, I think that in contemporary times in bad uh, it's not the best of things to do. And that is why we are asking the president if he so wishes to intervene. And that is where that is why we issue the state. It is my opinion. And we are entitled to it as lawyers that the sentence is harsh. And that is all we are saying. We ask the president to exercise uh, his powers under Article 72. We are entitled to that. The president has exercised that power many times, even for murderers. I will from that to some other stories now. And some youth in Achimoda in the Eastern region have set ablaze a residential apartment following the killing of a popular taxi driver by some unknown assailants. The victim, known in the area as Obuntia, was believed to have been approached by his assailants under the pretext of hiring his taxi to Odan Newtown, but was uh, allegedly murdered subsequently in a nearby house. The Irish youth, we are told, are now pointing accusing fingers at the caretaker of the house uh, as an accomplice. They accuse him of using the taxi driver for rituals. Correspondent Edwin Kofi Sian joins us on the phone now with some more on this very story. So, Kofi, what more do we know about this story? Well, uh, currently what is happening now is that some youth of the town have besieged the district command in order and are demanding the release of uh, some two suspects the police arrested this morning. Uh, they believe that when they release them, they can, you know, apply instant justice. But the police... Uh, are preventing them from, you know, getting access to the two suspects. So uh, currently, uh, that is what is happening in uh, on, in order. And just as you said, the incident happened uh, just last night, and the youth of the town besieged the resident after they realized that, or they were told that uh, the taxi driver has been murdered by uh, some unknown person. So uh, currently, in order, the place is a bit tense and the police are taking control of the incident. Well, why are these residents of the conviction that uh, this person who lives in the other house is responsible for the death or the murder of this taxi driver? They suspect him as an accomplice because according to them, uh, the people couldn't just come to the house to you know, perform what they did last night. They believe that uh, what, they, what they did the uh, the caretaker of the house knew something about it so mm -hmm. if they're able to get him uh, he'll be able to tell how and which people were involved in the killing of the taxi driver right i don't go visit many thanks for that a bit but do stay on because uh, i know there's uh, some more you'd have to tell us uh, particularly about this story where one person we are told is feared dead with seven others injured in a road accident at mount Kong, a suburb of sumum on the Accra kumasi highway two trucks are said to have collided head-on when one of the vehicles from Accra overtook a stationary one. Edwin uh, Kofisian again has some more on this and uh, he's still with us on the line. He'll give us those details now. So, Kofi, tell us more about this accident as well. Well, there, there, there was this stationary truck at Mount Kwon and uh, one other truck was also coming from Accra to Kumase and it tried overtaking uh, the stationary one and unfortunately, he, he it had to collide with the one coming from Kumasi, and a Kia car that was also coming from Accra didn't, you know, see exactly what was happening in front of him and crashed his vehicle into the already the cars that were, were involved in the accident already. And so the driver in the car cra in the Kia car uh, died instantly, and seven other persons, you know, got injured and they've been sent to the Suhum Government Hospital and receiving treatment. 
I don't confess how many thanks for that update. And that was our correspondent in the Eastern region bringing us some more on uh, those two stories there. But away from that, uh, well, we'll bring you some more stories here on news today. But let's first take a break. We'll be back shortly with some more. Stay with us. Many thanks for staying with us here on News Today to some more stories now. And joining us is investigative journalist Manasseh Azuri Awene has launched his first book titled Voice of Conscience. The book is a selection of Manasseh's write-ups covering uh, politics and corruption from 2009 to 2014. The award-winning journalist also pays tributes to some gallant journalists such as uh, the late BBC's uh, Komla Dumor and uh, also some other presidents on the African continent, including the late President John Evans Atamels, as well as Nelson Mandela of South Africa. With the encouraging beats from his favorite Bababo group, the boy from Bongo, as he is fondly called, launched his first book, Voice of Conscience. The launch took place at the Christ the King Parish Hall in Accra and was well attended with a large number of book-loving Ghanaians. The book is a collection of articles written by Manasse Azuri Awune from 2009 to 2014 and includes the famous article titled The Last Letter of John Evans at a Mills to former President Rawlings. Deputy Minister for Communications Atu Sopong attended the ceremony. Manasse's father and his his junior high school teacher were also present. Patrons expressed delight with the book and encouraged other journalists to follow suit. Let me congratulate Manasi for putting together the thoughts, the compilation of his stories. I think it is good. Uh, we have a problem in Ghana and that is that uh, our journalists, our senior journalists do not write. So those coming up do not have the benefit of the experiences of the senior ones. But what is done is being able to capture all his thoughts into one single book. In such a way that if you pick the book, you are able to read almost all his articles from 2009 to 2014. I think it's a great idea. Uh, we encourage others to do uh, similar initiatives and make sure that they put their thoughts and their ideas out there for people to pick and read. I'm very happy for Manasseh. You know, unfortunately in this country, the business of honesty, integrity, and righteousness does not sell. I'm certain that if it was another thing, just comedy, it would have been full. But I am so happy about what has happened here this evening. I am glad that there is a voice of conscience. I am not saying he is the only one. Probably he is the first person to have put his thoughts and his writings together. But what will build this nation are the values of integrity, honesty. And I, I, am, I am happy that it is beginning to get together. I am, I, this is what makes me hopeful for this country. And I'm glad that there are people like Manasseh Azuri are willing to do this. As in every literally material expectation is that this book will go out there, influence minds, impact attitudes, and affect conscience in terms of how we all think about the big issues that affect all of us, affect our well-being, and affect country and people. The book was reviewed by award-winning columnist Kofi Akpabli and it was auctioned with patrons supporting the project with as much as 10,000 Ghana CDs and the first round of bidding. Well, if you do not have a copy of that book, I'm sure you should be uh, rushing to grab one. It's titled The Voice of Conscience. I'm sure you have a, a conscience. But uh, time now for some business. John Kujomako is standing by with those details. Stay with us.